Shabbat Shalom. I'd like to begin by reading a selection from a letter written by Alan Zimmerman, president of Congregation Beit Israel in Charlottesville. Judaism has always asserted that nothing can replace bearing witness, so I think you'll agree with me that his testimony warrants a few minutes of our attention. He writes, on Saturday morning, I stood outside our synagogue with the armed security guard we hired after the police department refused to provide us with an officer during morning services. 40 congregants were inside. Here's what I witnessed during that time. For half an hour, three men dressed in fatigues and armed with semi-automatic rifles stood across the street from the temple. Had they tried to enter, I don't know what I could have done to stop them, but I couldn't take my eyes off them either. Perhaps the presence of our armed guard deterred them. Perhaps their presence was just a coincidence and I'm paranoid, I don't know. Several times, parades of Nazis passed our building shouting, there's the synagogue, followed by anti-Semitic chants. Some carried flags with swastikas and other Nazi symbols. A guy in a white polo shirt walked by the synagogue several times, arousing suspicion. Was he casing the building or trying to build up courage to commit a crime? We didn't know. Later, I noticed that the man accused in the automobile terror attack wore the same polo shirt as the man who kept walking by our synagogue. Apparently, it's the uniform of a white supremacist group. Even now, that gives me a chill. When services ended, my heart broke as I advised congregants that it would be safer to leave the temple through the back entrance rather than through the front and to please go in groups. This is 2017 in the United States of America. Later that day, I arrived on the scene shortly after the car plowed into peaceful protesters. It was a horrific and bloody scene. Soon we learned that Nazi websites had posted a call to burn our synagogue. I sat with one of our rabbis and wondered whether we should go back to the temple to protect the building. What could I do if I were there? Fortunately, it was just talk, but we had already deemed such an attack within the realm of possibilities, taking the precautionary step of removing our Torahs, including a Holocaust scroll from the premises. Again, this is in America, 2017. At the end of the day, we felt we had no choice but to cancel a Havdalah service at a congregant's home. It had been announced on a public Facebook page and we were fearful that Nazi elements might be aware of the event. Again, we sought police protection, not a battalion of police, just a single officer, but we were told simply to cancel the event. Local police faced an unprecedented problem that day, but make no mistake, Jews are a specific target of these groups. And despite nods of understanding from officials about our concerns, and despite the fact that the mayor himself is Jewish, we were left to our own devices. The fact that a calamity did not befall the Jewish community of Charlottesville on Saturday was not thanks to our politicians, our police, or even our own efforts, but to the grace of God. And yet, in the midst of all that, other moments stand out for me as well. John Aguilar, a 30-year Navy veteran, took it upon himself to stand watch over the synagogue through services Friday evening and Saturday evening along with our armed guard. He just felt he should. We experienced wonderful turnout for services both Friday night and Saturday morning to observe Shabbat, including several non-Jews who said they came to show solidarity, though a number of congregants, particularly elderly ones, told me they were afraid to come to synagogue. A frail elderly woman approached me Saturday morning as I stood on the steps in front of our sanctuary, crying, to tell me that while she was Roman Catholic, she wanted to stay and watch over the synagogue with us. At one point she asked, why do they hate you? I had no answer to the question, 
we've been asking ourselves for thousands of years. At least a dozen complete strangers stopped by as we stood in front of the synagogue Saturday to ask if we wanted them to stand with us. After the nation moves on, we will be left to pick up the pieces. Fortunately, this is a very strong and capable Jewish community blessed to be led by incredible rabbis. We have committed lay leadership and a congregation committed to Jewish values and our synagogue. In some ways, we will come out of it stronger, just as tempering metals make them tougher and harder. That's what he wrote. That's what he observed, what he witnessed. This is America in 2017. Most of us would never have imagined that we would be discussing a Nazi march in our country, ever. I'll make three points about these events. One, every single time we see anti-Semitism, we must address it head on, every single time. Whether it's an erroneous news story in the New York Times, a slander against Israel, or a diminishing comment about something as simple as you're having money, we must confront it. Companies know this. Companies have the obligation to aggressively defend their trademark. They know if they don't, they'll lose control over it. Their brand will be diluted and diminished. We're talking about a lot more than a fancy bag here. We're talking about our history and our identity and our safety. It feels like just yesterday that people joked about Jews being overzealous and hyper-reactive to anti-Semitism. We were accused of pointing out anti-Semitism everywhere, saying that every little negative thing about Israel or about Judaism was due to anti-Semitism. Well, I prefer that. I'd rather that we be overly protective of our people to the point of obsession rather than ignore anti-Semitism. Every time you encounter anti-Jewish sentiment, you have to protect and preserve your people. You have to call it out. For each of us, the Jewish people should be like our children. You wouldn't let anyone mess with your child. Every single time we see anti-Semitism, we must address it. Point two, know your history. Historical perspective matters. I don't even know where to start. Should I start with 740 BCE when the Assyrians exiled us from Israel? Should I start with 586 BCE when the temple was destroyed? No, it seems too far back. We can always tell ourselves the ancient world was a violent place. We can always remove ourselves from that. How about if I start in 1096 at the First Crusade when religious pilgrims stormed across Europe savagely murdering over 5,000 Jews? Or in 1124 when the Jewish quarter of Kiev was burned to the ground? Or in 1235 when in Germany Jews were accused of the blood libel of ritual murder? Or in 1243, we were accused of host desecration and an entire town of Jewish people was burned at the stake. 1492, expulsion from Spain, a place we had lived for hundreds of years. 1516, establishment of the Jewish ghetto in Venice. 1635, riots in Vilna. 1700s, more blood libels, more expulsions. 1800s, Karl Marx praises an essay that, quote, Money is the God of Israel. 1900s, you know what happened. Six million people gone forever. I can't even speak of it right now. Point two is know your history. You will understand the narrative much better. If we know from where we came, we will be more active about point one, we will be horrified, but we will not be surprised when hate rises up against us for no reason yet again. We will be ready. 
armed with knowledge and experience and the ability to better navigate such horrors. And by the way, lest we should pretend that anti-Semitism is a European problem, read the newspaper this week to change your mind. We are in a new chapter in history, and I don't know how it unfolds. Point three, hope. Hope is a necessary response to acts of anti-Semitism. With all of their attempts to destroy us, Davka, we are still here. We are the survivors. We are the remnants of all of those ancient people. We are keeping Judaism alive through our traditions, our practice, and our knowledge. We are teaching it to our children when we lie down and when we rise up. And that's not easy. I know it's not easy. We are a hopeful people. We end each Passover Seder with the iconic words, next year in Jerusalem. We know it might not happen. It probably won't. But we hope it will. We hope for a messianic age. It doesn't seem to me like that's what we're headed for right now. But still, we hope part of our character. I've been thinking a lot lately about how Moses never got to enter the promised land. It seems so unfair, so harsh. Why? But the more I think about it, the more it actually gives me hope. If he had, the story, our story, would be finished. Yes, it would have been a happy ending, but it also would have been a closed book. Story over, beginning, middle, and end, all completed. But it's not. It's unfinished. It goes on. We read it over and over and over in a circle, never coming to fruition. There's a lot to be said about that. I don't think that the messianic age where Moshe Rabbeinu enters the promised land is around the corner but I don't think the story is over either. We will go on. Our hope for a brighter future will not be dimmed. It's our obligation to hope that one day peace will be restored. We hope the people of our country will embrace equality for all. We hope that racism and sexism and anti-Semitism and hatred are extinguished. We hope the leadership of our country will guide us with a steady hand. We hope that a blanket of peace will sweep over us and that the Jewish people, our children, will continue to thrive forever. Kein may it be God's will.